tax finger weaves. You have your single weave. You get your checker and your plaid patterns. That's an over and under method. The second kind is our double weave. You get your diamond designs, dancing eagle, and your slants. Our third and oldest one is our oblique method and the beads making design. Uh, that's spice now. And before we have commercial yarn, we get fibers from milkweed and Indian hemp plant, and it looks something like this. We braid that together, and we make belts out of that. And we can work up from 10 to 200 strands of yarn at a time. This is 200. We usually make this long as a belt. You make about six of those, and then you tie them together, and you can make a blanket. And that could take about three Thank weeks you. to make a blanket. That's nice. That's a heavy hat. Mm -hmm. It is heavy. Thank you. And it can take a couple of days, about a week, just to make one belt. Are there any questions? Do the different patterns have any symbolism? Mm -hmm. uh, there are some patterns that go to some families, but usually just whatever design you want. Are there any other questions? Do you call them regalias here as well? What? Do you call your belts regalias here as well? Uh, I don't, do you know? I'm not a really finger woman. <laughs> do you know? Would you trade these or this is just for your own needs? Uh, you could trade it like as a water system. Or you could just your own needs. Are there any other questions? If not, can I turn it to All right, this is our bead working station. There are two different types of bead work. This is our solid work. This will be for your belt. You go through each bead twice. If this were to break, only a few beads would be lost and could be easily mended back together. Right before you finish your belt, you start beading onto the leather strap so you can tie it. The second kind is our scroll work. This will be beaded onto the men's leggings or women's skirt. And before we had steel needle, flax thread, and commercial beads, we get a deer hoof like this. We crush it up with a rock until it splinters out and we send it down. That'd be our needle. We use animal sinew for our thread. Which right here, these are pottery beads from our clay. Seashells that we trade from coastal tribes. And these gray ones right here, those are corn beads, also known as Job's Tears. And they look like this. They grow almost like on a short corn stalk. And you just pull those fibers out and it'll make a natural bead. Oh, that's not here. Are there any questions? That's now the next one. Have a nice day. Thank you. Alright, this is our pottery section. We have two methods of making our pottery. The first one is our ball method. You get a lump of clay and you roll into a tight ball. And then you put your thumb down in the middle and your index finger on the outside. And you'll see your general ball shape. Our second kind is our coil method. You start out with a flat disc like this. Then you just roll out little snakes of clay and you stack them on top of each other. That's like for your taller pottery. Let this sit for about a day or two so they're firm enough to put designs in. So before you put your patterns, you get a smooth river stone like this. You just go along it, you get all the little imperfections out, all the little wonks and stuff. And the river stone also brings out the oils inside the clay, and it'll give it that natural glaze. But the way we can put our designs in is our sticks. You just edge in whatever design you want. We could use corn to give it like a rough texture. We use corn, we crush it up before we fire our pots, we lay it all around the inside, and that fire, it'll melt the oils inside, and it'll make it waterproof. Once we got our metal tools, we can start making paddles, and stamp it on them. 
let that sit for about two weeks to a month so they get this white chalky color. That's how you know they're ready to be fired. And once they're ready to be fired, you can pick what color you want. If you want a dark pot like this, you use softwoods because it has more smoke than flame. And a lighter pot, use hardwoods because it has more flame than smoke. And the firing process, it can take up to 24 hours. This right here has both hard and soft woods. This is one of our wedding vases. This is more of like a western design though. Ours would be like the cups would be pinched together. Like these back here. Are there any questions? Uh, the what it used to be like our wedding ceremonies. Like a man would pick out this side, the woman would pick out the other. Like, um, are there any other questions? carving station. This is what our, our gardening tools would look like before metal tools. This is made out of plants. This wood right here is rhododendron. A rhododendron is a tree with a flower on top of it. And it'd be tied on with animal singing. Once Europeans got here, they started teaching us how to blacksmith. That's what one of our metal ones would look like. These right here, these are armbands, not handcuffs. We chose the Europeans for like copper pans and pots, but we had no use for them because we had our pottery, so we just make armbands. And armbands are just like, we had more social status with that. This is what our food utensils would look like. This would be made out of mountain can. This would be a fork. And then we have a hollowed out bison horn for our, our spoon. And a board bowl. Once your paints got here, we start copying them, like this. This right here is our pipe stone. There are seven holes to represent our seven clans. And we use rabbit tobacco on the inside. It's ten times stronger than regular tobacco. So if you inhale that all of the smoke into your lungs, your lungs can collapse and you can die. So we like force the smoke into our mouth, our mouth only. We say our prayer and then we would release the smoke into the atmosphere. And the way we got our holes and our stones and our masks is our bow drill or our pump drill. The way you use that, you simply go to wherever you want your hole. And you start to push down. Those carved down into it. This right here is our rattle before metal tools. It'd be made of gourd. And all of our battles, they'd be used for our dances, just to keep the dancer on beat. Once we got metal tools, we could just carve it down with like wood. On the inside, you could use corn, rocks, sticks, whatever makes the noise. These conch shells, we trade with coastal tribes. We could take off the tips. We could make a bead or decoration out of that. And the rest, we crush it up into like a white powder. We add water to get our white wash. And then animal fats to get our white paint. This is one of our ceremonial water dippers. They explain this more in our council house lecture later on. Uh, our mask back here, these are for our dances. This would be made out of flint with our flint blades. It's like hickory bark. Yeah. Once we got metal tools, we could just carve it down. The way we'd use our mask if we were in a dance and we were like, we're doing a bird dance, we'd use one of our bird masks. Are there any questions? Is that made out of gourd? Oh uh, yeah, that's right. And they wouldn't usually be painted like that. They should have that one. Yeah. What about your other masks? What kind of wood are they made out of? Uh, I think like softwoods, like chestnut. All kind of. <laughs> are there any other questions? Yeah, how often do you do ceremonial dances? Uh, it's like, what, what are you saying? Like, mm -hmm. How often do we do our dances? Oh, we would have done them, I mean, multiple times a day back then. 
I mean, we still do them every now and then. We still have our ceremonies we get together on weekends. Mm -hmm. we do. But back then, uh, basically, we would have danced about seven different times of the day. Doing those seven dances along with those, for those seven different plans. Are there any other questions? Okay, I'm going to answer our next question. Yeah. Hope you all have one. Okay. 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 This is what our basket is look like with our front legs. It's made of hickory bark. So we went up to hickory tree, stepped off the bark, and that's how you got your splint. This basket was made when the grocery store opened in 1952. And once we got our metal tools, we started using river cane, like this right here. We also use wide oak, like this. And to like make that into splints, you cut it into like four to eight and like all that. That took about two weeks to do, mm -hmm. just to get it down to like this. If you're here, different colors in our splints. They're like lighter and darker colors. The way we do that, we dye our splints. We use butternut for our black. Like this. Walnut for our brown. Yellow for yellows, and then blood root for our orange. <laughs> we have two different types of candles. This is our interlocking candle. This will be your first step of making the basket. You weave your basket all the way around it, so this will be more for carrying heavier stuff. If this handle were to break, you have to unweave your whole basket, put a new handle, and then weave it back. Second kind is a drop handle. You start at the bottom, you make your way to the top. Right before you finish your basket, you put your handles on and you just do the rim. If these were to break, you just undo the rim, put some new handles on, and then do the rim back. We have two different types of weaves. You have your single weave. You start at the bottom, you make your way all the way to the top, and you just finish there. Our second kind is our double weave. You start at the bottom, you make your way all the way to the top. Right before, like, not before you finish, right when you get to the top, you bend your strips back down, and then you move to the bottom again. So where you start is where you finish. As you're moving that, you put two separate beads left in there, so they hold water. And what they're doing back there right now is dying some splints. And dying splints, they can take up about two weeks. If you use a river tank, it'll take a little longer, just because it's more water. And the longer you die, it's going to more body and close This basket right here, it would usually be the size of this log. You put leather straps on, and if you're in the cornfield, you just take off the corn and make it in. And the way we make our basket, you start out with a mat, like this. You start in the middle, and you just make your way out. And the strip would be like a lot longer, and you bend your strips up, and you go on the edge. Are there any questions? He, he said you use uh, blood root and even yellow root uh, for the basket for, for the coloring? Or? Yeah. yeah. This is for blood root. And that's there. And it's, uh, we got plenty of yellow root in our backyard if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a good one. I'm going to set the way Hi, 
Wait, is there a weapon station? I see you're Randy and Kevin, they're making our arrowheads. Okay. The way we make our arrowheads, we start out with a big piece of fun like this. And we call it flint knifing. You get a rock, and you go along the edges, along these ridges, and I'll knock off little flint plates. And you try and thin it out as much as possible. Once it gets relatively thin, you can start to pressure plate. The way you pressure plate, you get a dare antler, like this. You go along the edges, and that's where arrowhead will get a sharp knife. We have two different types of rare heads. You have your round shoulder. This will be for hunting. So if I shot a deer with that, I can easily pull it back out, wash it, and reuse it. And it's tied on my plant fibers. This one right here is obsidian, and it's a square shoulder, and it's used for a war. And it's tied on with animal sinew. The way we use these, you choose somebody, and once that sinew touches blood, it'll expand, and the egg will get loosened up inside of their body. So they have to cut their stuff open and dig it out. If they catch it in time, they can push it all the way through, but they can't pull it out because it'll just do more damage than it did going in. And the obsidian, if that hits bone, it'll shatter into a bunch of little pieces. You have to dig all those little pieces out. Uh, this right here is our bow. It's made of hickory or yellow locust, and the string is bear intestine. Turkey, we don't really like to use a uh, bow and arrow for war. We use our war clubs. This would be with our flint blades. If we might have a tree knot or a tree root. Once we got our metal tools, we can just carve it down. <coughs> the way we do these, we break, we wouldn't go for their head and we wouldn't kill them automatically. We break their leg and their arm so they couldn't walk off the field and their men would have to carry them off. Not then not the plane field. Right here's our blow gun. This may have river cane. The way you can make it, you uh, cut down a piece of river cane. You let it dry out. As it dries, it'll get a little curly. So you have to put it over an open fire. You put it on your knee and you just bend it out. Once it gets pretty thin, you still have all these little joints in there. So you pour sand down in there. And you get something like this. And you go in and just knock all those little pieces out. And the blow gun, it could be from 4 to 12 feet long. A blow gun dart. It's made of yellow locust. This right here is Scottish thistle. The Scottish thistle looks like that little plant down there. And it takes about three pods just to do one dart. And blow gun is for like a small gun like rabbits and squirrels. The large thing goes a turkey. Now it has to be a headshot. This right here is our adolado. This will be for our spears. You put your tip of the spear right there, and you'll hold it down here, you'll launch it, it'll go a lot farther and a lot faster that way. An experienced hunter can kill an animal about a hundred yards away with that. Uh, if you'll step over here, I'll give you a demonstration on our blowgun. turkey today. <laughs> Are there any questions for weapons? I got one question. How similar is the river cane to bamboo? Are there big differences? Uh, bamboo is like a lot bigger than it. A lot bigger. Yeah, but other than... it's not from here. Exactly. Okay. Are there any other questions? The one with the, uh, the one that was like, uh, that you use the hatches of the spear. Oh, the atomizer? Yeah. How big can the weapon be that you can launch using it? Uh, spear leg? Yeah, spear. That's what they're for, spear. Now I'm just showing you like that little one, because we don't have a spear around here. Do you have one lying around? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, if you know the questions, this is
you say Dana Doug and hi you, so that means we can meet, oh, that means until we meet again, because we can meet in this life or the next life. Thank y'all very much. Thank you. Oh, y'all start heading down to our traps in our living history section. They'll be reenacting our eight. Smile. Right. Now switching the video. Much you know. Look at these tennis things. We got tons of red clay. Yeah, I feel you. There are some of the mountains around here that are made entirely just red clay. It's like back home, everything's red clay. You know, yeah. Yeah, but it's very useful for making uh, yeah. breaks and things. Oh, yeah. Can we go in? Is that okay? Oh yeah, feel free to. Yeah, and uh, aside from the appearance, the major difference between this house and that house is the housing that can hold. Right. That's four to six up there. Why this one's six to twelve? The major difference is the loft. That's halfway across. This goes all the way across so it can oh. use the sleeping quarters. Oh, wow. And the entrance is in between both of the beds, just above the shelf. Okay. There'll be a ladder the adults can set there so kids can crawl, crawl up there to sleep. Mm -hmm. yeah. There'll be a ladder the adults would place down so that way the kids can climb up. Now that one up there, it could be a little sleeping quarters, but it probably only has about three more people on that type of lot. So it'd be about four or six, maybe seven people on that house up there. But this one has a full complete lot that can be used just as the sleeping quarters. It has a lot more people that way. These seem much better built than the ones you see when the Europeans start building. Yeah, uh, because we did take time to actually, uh, not necessarily mathematically, kind of cut it and make it more measured. Mm -hmm. Oh, they work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sweat houses and sweat lodges are used for all kinds of things ceremonial, spiritual, and all kinds of things. Yeah. I've only been in a dugout. That's cool. And it was just used to cure diseases or. Mm hmm, exactly. This is ultra cool right here. You can put sweet grass or sage. Some people are out there with the use of shaving it down if they need to. So you do find like a lot of people are pitching in to help. So that's what does help build it in lesser time. If it was just the family that needed the house, it would probably take much more longer. So when you're coming, here. This is what they saw people living pretty much. Uh, no. No. We adapted to their style. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we were originally living in what's called a waddle and doll house. Okay. It's, imagine this, but without the wood frame. It's the post put in the ground, saplings tied around the post to help form the wall itself. Okay. But on top of the saplings, we'd weave a mat, and on top of that mat, pack red clay on top of it. Oh. So the entire wall is nothing but red clay. As opposed to actually having wood logs laying across it. Okay. The Adena did. That's very cool. Yeah, it's uh, very similar to the adobe you'd see out west. Okay. Uh, just more 
out here. And still uses red clay, so it's still going to be cool on the still inside. Red clay. I've yeah. heard waddle and dog before, but I never understood what like, the words actually mean. Yeah. 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 Waddle is to essentially build a foundation. The gob is putting the clay on top of it. Okay. No, I want to Could we get a picture with you? Oh, sure. Yeah. This is fascinating. Thank you so much. I can't touch me. That's trout, I think. Might be some carp in there, too, not sure. Small scale, full scale canoe, it'll be anywhere from 30 to 60 feet and weigh between 700 to 1,000 pounds. It'll be about three to five feet in width. Wow. It's still float. Wow. Yep. How long would it take from a uh, tree brought in to completed? 18 months to two years. Yeah, it's, yeah.
before we get started, I'm going to lay down a couple of ground rules. The first is there will be crew and draft fighting after the end of our monitoring this year. Um, so we have to see the main team's off the radio. So feel free to take a few pictures, videos, that you like. Make sure it's in a flat stop so that I can't be distracted from performers out here. Um, there will be a gunshot at one point, so just before one for that. So with that being said, we have 1752. Uh, Henry Timberlake, who is an military of the has a traveling throughout the territory of the United States to give us that history of the English and Cherokee um, past. Uh, he has now won a ship over to England where he takes the great Cherokee leaders of Tomato, Dan and Turkey, and Tali City to meet his people and stuff. Uh, Henry Timberlake is also a Navy Seal Corps Marine 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 Corps but not everybody is happy with that new draft industry and money is driving into the civil action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You summoned me. You did. It's great to have you back in our village, John McCormick. I trust your journey as well. Uh, as well as it could have been. Timberlake is now escorting Ostinaco and the others across the ocean, and soon they'll be meeting with the king himself. Now, this piece was not easy to come by, but it could be a lasting one. I'm surprised you didn't accompany them to England. Yeah, I left the old world a long time ago, and I've got no intention of returning now. My place is here, so long as you'll have me. You're always welcome here in, the, in our village, Quentin. Thank you. Uh, though I must ask, why have you called upon me? I appreciate the gesture, but I can't imagine the two of you would call me here just to welcome me back. We are pleased with your return, but you are right. There is another reason. It's good that you return now. Why is that? Our scouts have recently discovered a group of white men sleeping about in the dark, far too close to our village for us to be comfortable. Could it be the French? It's a bit out of their way, but I can't imagine that the English would come this close to your village now that peace has been struck. No, it's not the French. The clothing they wear is like to the English, but I don't believe in the soldiers. Militia, then? That is what I believe in. Ostinaco and the others have worked hard for this piece. You know this better than most. I'll place my trust in our leaders, and through them I'll trust the British to keep their word. However, I'm not so foolish to believe that everyone is pleased with this piece. It's dangerous to let these men be. I've sent words with our scouts to make contact with their leaders. We bring them in here so that we can have a meeting with them. Well, without knowing why they're coming, that could also be dangerous. That is my fear as well. If this our village is not in a state of war, I'll defer to the peace chief in this matter. If you feel there's a peaceful solution to all of this, you will have my support. Thank you. And if there's no peace to be had, you will have my support as well. And what is my role in all of this? You have been raised in the ways of the whites, so you have a better understanding of them than we do. Plus, you have trouble with the greatest peacemakers of our time. I will welcome your counsel. <laughs> Me. I brought them in at your last week, Chief. The land is fake to the head men of this village. I am Doc Sheep, Peace Chief. And this is Zisu Lily Huwatsan, War Chief of El Canela. We have invited you here for a meeting. There's no reason to make demands. Chief of Peace and another of War. Is there no one amongst you who's truly capable of leadership? We're not so arrogant as to believe that one person has the answer to all questions. Who are you, and why do you come here? Straight to the point, then, is it? You shouldn't expect these creatures to understand pleasantries. <coughs> Very well. Let's hear it'll be. I am Captain James... McLaughlin. And who might you be that you'd know my name? Wait. On second look, I do recognize this one. McCormack. <laughs> John McCormack. Christ, I thought they left your body to rot in Colladin. Well, it takes more than a few English to keep me down, and more than a few cowards. Cowardice and cunning are often confused. Genuinely surprised, though. Would have never expected to find you living as a lapdog amongst these, uh, people. McCormick is none of your concern. We are. Stay your business. I've come on behalf of the province of North Carolina. I've come to collect debts owed to the people of North Carolina in the outlining territories. What is it they find you of? Take you raise up the territory of cost numerous in resources, horses, food, munitions, your people have held homestead captive, and I can shudder at the thought of what you might have done to those families. The people of North Carolina demand to be repaid for all that's been taken. I assure you, we have participated in no such raids against your colony. And even with the war that's worse, 
people of the Okanath yet remain peaceful. Perhaps as the Shawnee has struck out of this world, the Cherokees have pledged himself to peace. But if you believe you have been wronged or if you, we owe you anything, you should work through John Stewart. He is loyal to your crown and a friend of ours. Tell them, I suggest you take your leave. I will not continue playing these games with you. Cherokee thievery of forces has led to war once before. The blood from those battles is not even dried yet. And here we are again. Hey, listen, we are not unreasonable people. You seem to have little value here, and I don't want to be here any longer than I must. So there are arrangements that could be made. There are no arrangements to have. Take your hollow words and leave our I will live on the decks you paid. That lapdog McCormick here, I'm sure you have a few valued trade goods in the boat. Maybe some uh, muskets, some rifles, present those to us, and maybe the situation can resolve itself. And if you simply will not part with all that, I'm certain some of your squaws could provide us with a fair bit of entertainment. That would do nicely. Enough! The patient was spoken, and I'll hear no more from you. You dare come to our home wearing the scouts of our people, making demands and threatening our women. Leave our village now while you still can. Same as there are no more words to be had here, Pace Chief. Very well. We'll go. I wouldn't become too comfortable in this rat's nest you call a home. Shame you could not be more reasonable. You might have lived longer. <laughs> What happened? It was about to call him years ago. It was a last rebellion my own people made against the English. Now the clans had finally united. We were going to stop that oppression once and for all, or die in the attack. Now McLaughlin was supposed to watch our flank during the battle. I'm not sure when the lines fell or how many had died, but it was too late. McLaughlin had betrayed us. He raised the colors of the English and turned his men against us. I thought it was all done, most of us lay dead or dying. I've often wondered what I'd do if I ever ran across them again. If he's such a coward, he had nothing to worry about. He's a coward to be sure, but make no mistake, he was once a cunning warrior. He knows now where that you know where he is. If he has a chance, he'll vanish. And you'll never see him again until he feels this village is at its weakest. Well, if he intends to set a trap for us, perhaps we should prepare one for him as well. Warchief, you know what must be done. I have my support.
in return, John. You'd have done best to run like all the other filthy savages. Huh. I thought you were the expert on running. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when will you learn, John? <laughs> Nothing you do matters. Nothing this chief does matters. All those Cherokee and English who work for the peace, that Lieutenant Timberland <coughs> who's taking those mongrels to make the king, all of it in vain. I will burn this place to the ground, and you Right along with it. When all of this is but a smoking ruin, we'll do so to the next miserable little pile of filth these vermin call home. And the next, and the next, and the next, there will be a call for war. And men like us will be in high demand. We will flay every Indian we come across. And those redskins will make us wealthy men. You worry not about this squad. She'll fetch a strong price, and if not, ah, she'll make a fine addition to the collection. <laughs> you let her go, or you will not see the end of the day. Your pet McCormick is already wounded. What'd you expect? To stand alone against all of us. Oh! <laughs> 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 
Oh, 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 Well, she God, I did so long. God, Devin, God, 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 Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Devin Cucumber. I work as a historical interpreter here at the Okanoft Indian Village, as well as uh, being the props master and maintaining the weaponry these fine gentlemen all use over there unto these hills. Hi, I'm Matthew Frankel. I also work at Under These Hills. I play Asa the Miner. She owned a God, I way not, I'm Marcus. I work here at the village. She I'm Johnny Chris. I also work here at the village. Hi, I'm Aaron Botts. I work at Unto These Hills where I play Tecumseh. Hi, I'm Anoop. I'm a dancer at Unto These Hills. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Carter. I also work over at Drama where I play Monk. Hello, everybody. My name is Nathan Bush. I'm the program coordinator here at the village. Hi, guys. My name is Cody Taylor. I also work at Unto These Hills playing Reverend Shermerhorn, and I also serve as assistant pilot. Hello, my name is Eileen. I work over here at the village and also at the drama. Hi, my name is Michael Brewer, and I work at Unto These Hills as well, where I play Senator Webster. Hello everyone, you can call me Bloodyfoot if you'd like. I'm a historic interpreter here at the village, and I also play the role of John Ross at Unto These Hills. I would like to take a moment to thank uh, first our singer for today. Um, that was Mr. Jacob Craig. And I would like to thank everyone from Unto These Hills who comes and gets killed by us every other day. <laughs> Consider it. it is a wonderful show. It tells the story of the Cherokee beginning with their first contact with the Europeans up to the events that lead to the removal of the Till of Tears. It is a powerful story. We perform that nightly except for Sundays with a pre-show beginning at 7.30 and the main show beginning at 8. You can get more information and even purchase tickets at our box office right here at the village. I do hope you'll consider joining us there as well. Now, if you have just arrived at the village and have not yet had your guided tour, if you head back up towards the box office, they will set you up with a tour guide. If you were in the middle of your tour and that was interrupted so that you could join us here, you can meet with your tour guide exactly where you left off. And if you had already finished that guided portion of our village, your next stop will be right here in the square for a lecture here at 1230. All of us will also be over here by our storage house for a few moments. If you'd like to say hello or take any pictures of this young woman right here. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to say, sir.